In an age before plastic, concrete, or steel, the world was built from wood. It held up roofs, framed ships, shaped bridges, and filled hearths with heat. But while our modern lumber warps, splits, and decays in a few short years, medieval wood crafted centuries ago still stands. The beams of thousand-year-old barns, the ribs of ancient ships, the foundations of medieval churches and bridges, they remain astonishingly intact, defying time, weather, and even water. What did medieval builders know that we have forgotten? This is the story of how medieval wood survived centuries without rotting, how modern methods lost that knowledge, and what secrets lie hidden in the forests, fires, and workshops of the Middle Ages. Across Europe, remnants of medieval craftsmanship still defy decay. In England, oak beams and barns from the 13th century remain solid enough to bear full weight. In Norway, stave churches built from pine still stand proud through a thousand winters. In Venice, entire neighborhoods rest on wooden piles driven into lagoon mud 800 years ago. And the wood has never rotted. Meanwhile, modern decks, fences, and houses crumble after just a few decades. Even in rivers, medieval bridge timbers remain dark and strong beneath the waterline. The secret lies not in chemicals or treatments, but in how medieval people viewed wood itself. For them, wood was not just material. It was living matter that needed to be understood, respected, and prepared in harmony with nature. They believed wood carried memory, season, and spirit. They knew when to cut, how to dry, and where to place it. And those old methods, though forgotten by most, created wood that could last almost forever. One of the first secrets begins not in the workshop, but in the forest. Medieval woodcutters didn't fell trees randomly. They followed a calendar, often guided by the moon and the cold. In winter, when sap stopped flowing and moisture content was lowest, the wood was harvested. They called it felling in the sleep of the tree. Cutting wood in January, when the moon waned, was thought to keep worms away and slow decay. T Today, science confirms what superstition once taught. Trees cut in winter indeed have lower moisture and sugar levels, making them far less prone to fungi, insects, and rot. Less food for microorganisms meant longer life for the wood. The medieval craftsman didn't have a lab, he had centuries of observation. He knew by feel, by smell, by the sound of the axe biting into frozen bark, whether the wood was right. Those who ignored the rule paid the price. Builders who cut in the wrong season saw their beams twist, crack, or crumble within a generation. Those who followed it built cathedrals that still stand. The second secret lies in the forest itself. Medieval Europe was rich in old-growth trees, vast stands of oak, pine, and fir that had grown undisturbed for hundreds of years. These trees grew slowly in dense, shaded forests, competing for light and nutrients. Their growth rings were tight and even, their fibers dense and resin-rich. The result was wood that was naturally water-resistant, extremely hard, and structurally stable. Modern timber, by contrast, is often fast-grown plantation wood. Trees are cut in 20 or 30 years, their rings wide and soft, their fibers full of moisture and sugar. It's efficient for profit, but disastrous for durability. The peasants who cut medieval wood didn't measure their work in seasons. They measured it in generations. The same forest that gave birth to a child's cradle would one day frame that child's home. Nature's slow rhythm gave medieval builders the raw material that time itself could not defeat. Once a tree was cut, medieval carpenters performed a ritual that today would seem strange. They burned it, not to destroy, but to preserve. The technique is now called Shosugi Ban in Japan, but it existed across Europe centuries before. Medieval builders lightly charred the surface of posts and beams that would touch the ground or water. The thin layer of charcoal created a barrier resistant to fungi, bacteria, and insects. Guard would repel moisture, harden the surface, and sealed pores naturally. A burned beam could stand in damp earth for decades without rotting. Modern science confirms the wisdom of this practice. Charred wood is hydrophobic, it absorbs less water, and the carbonized layer prevents oxygen from feeding decay organisms. To medieval eyes, fire was purification. Two hours, it was chemistry. But the result was the same, enduring strength born from controlled flame. Few things seem more destructive to wood than water, yet many medieval structures owe their longevity to it. In Venice, for instance, 
The entire city rests on millions of wooden piles driven deep into the lagoon mud. Instead of rotting, these timbers hardened over centuries, preserved by oxygen-starved sediments and minerals. Medieval builders understood this instinctively. They knew that would submerged completely, without exposure to air, would last longer than would left half wet and half dry. So bridge foundations, dock pilings, and mill supports were deliberately sunk deep, beyond reach of rot. In rivers across Europe, archaeologists find oak posts from the 10th and 11th centuries still sound beneath the surface. The same material that would crumble in your backyard today remained untouched beneath the medieval waterline. It wasn't magic. It was an understanding of nature's rules that rot needs air as much as it needs moisture. Medieval builders didn't fight the environment. They worked with it. The next secret came from knowing the tree from the inside out. Every trunk holds two kinds of wood, sapwood on the outer layers and heartwood at the core. Sapwood carries water and nutrients while the tree is alive. It's soft, full of sugar, and highly vulnerable to rot. Heartwood, by contrast, is dry, dense, and impregnated with natural resins and tannins that resist decay. Medieval carpenters knew this instinctively. They always used heartwood for beams, boats, and bridges, never sapwood. They cut away the outer layers entirely, even if it meant wasting a large portion of the log. To modern industries that chase efficiency, that might seem foolish, but to medieval craftsmen, quality meant survival. A beam of pure heartwood could last for centuries. A plank with sapwood might crumble in 20 years. This careful selection is one reason why medieval would still stand strong. While our chemically treated planks rot in damp basements, oak, for instance, contains high levels of tannins, natural compounds that protect against fungi and insects. Pine and fir are rich in resins, sticky and hydrophobic, sealing the wood from moisture. Medieval builders knew which species worked best in different environments. They used oak for churches and ships, pine for roofs and beams, yew for boughs, and larch for anything exposed to water. They understood that not all wood was equal. In Northern Europe, oak was so prized that it was often regulated by law. Certain forests were reserved for shipbuilding alone. In the Alps, mountain villages used larch because it could withstand decades of snow and rain. Each choice reflected centuries of trial and adaptation. Medieval people didn't invent preservatives. They chose wood that preserved itself. Even after felling and cutting, wood was not used immediately. Modern sawmills often kill dry wood in days, baking moisture out quickly. But medieval craftsmen relied on slow, natural air drying, a process that took months, sometimes years. Logs were stacked under open sheds, Protected from rain but exposed to wind, the drying was patient and even allowing internal stresses to settle gradually. No cracking, no warping, no trapped moisture. Slow drying let resins harden and tannins stabilize, making the wood far more durable. When it finally entered the workshop, the timber was seasoned not only by time but by the elements. It's another case where speed sacrificed longevity. The medieval builder could wait because he built for generations, not production lines even the best would still needed protection. Medieval carpenters turned to nature's oils and tars for that. They used linseed oil, pressed from flax seeds, to coat wood surfaces. The oil penetrated deep, sealing pores, and creating a flexible, water-resistant layer. For harsher exposure, they mixed pine, tar, beeswax, or even animal fat with ash or lime. Bridge timbers were soaked in boiling tar. Roof beams were rubbed with oil and soot. These mixtures smelled terrible but worked beautifully. They kept out moisture, discouraged insects, and allowed wood to breathe without cracking. In northern climates, wood treated this way could last centuries, as many barns and ships still prove today. In contrast, modern pressure-treated lumber uses harsh chemicals that eventually leach, crack, and fail. The medieval world didn't need poisons. It trusted the chemistry of plants and fire. A hidden secret of longevity lies not just in the wood itself, but in how it was joined. Medieval builders didn't rely on nails or glue. They used joinery, carefully fitted mortise and tenon joints, wooden pegs, and interlocking frames. Each connection allowed the wood to move naturally with humidity and temperature changes. No stress fractures. No splitting. When one beam swelled, another flexed. The structure breathed like a living body. 
Modern builders often lock wood in place with screws and metal brackets that restrict movement, leading to cracking and rot at stress points. The medieval carpenter built with humility, accepting that wood changes with the seasons. That acceptance gave his work life. The difference is philosophical as much as technical. We try to control materials. We try to understand them. Everything about medieval woodworking moved in rhythm with the natural world. The tree grew in the forest for a century, was felled in winter, dried for years, then cut and shaped by hand with respect and patience. Each step added endurance. Each pause allowed balance. When you look at a medieval beam darkened by age, you see not only the skill of the craftsman, but the rhythm of a culture that valued slowness. Every stroke of the adze, every chisel mark, carried an awareness that this beam might stand long after its maker was gone. The builder wasn't just creating a roof for his own life, he was shaping a legacy for his grandchildren. In that sense, medieval wood endures because it was never made for quick use, it was made for permanence. Today we live in a world of speed. Our lumber is harvested too young, dried too fast, and treated too cheaply. We've replaced patience with production, and the result is wood that looks strong but dies quickly. Factory kilns crack the fibers, pressure treatments trap moisture, thin planks of soft sap wood bend under weather. Even our houses, once symbols of permanence, are built to last only a few decades. In the pursuit of profit, we traded endurance for efficiency, and in doing so, we lost a kind of ancient wisdom that materials like people thrive when given time and care. Modern research now proves what medieval builders always sensed. Studies of ancient oak beams reveal that their molecular structure has changed over centuries, becoming more crystalline and water-resistant due to natural aging. Comparative analysis shows that old-growth timber contains up to twice the lignin density of modern fast-grown wood, making it significantly more roach-resistant. Even without chemicals, the combination of slow growth, correct felling, natural drying, and plant-based oils creates a synergy of preservation that modern industry has never truly replicated. What medieval people did by intuition and experience we now understand through science, yet somehow we've forgotten to apply it. To medieval people, wood was not disposable. It was sacred, part of the cycle of life, death and renewal. Churches were built from oak, to symbolize strength. Ships were seen as living beings. Even coffins were carved from the same trees that had once sheltered homes. Wood had spirit. When a beam was placed, it wasn't just functional. It was a connection between earth and heaven. That reverence is perhaps the greatest preservation method of all. When you treat material as alive, you build to protect it. When you see it as disposable, you accept decay. Our ancestors believed their work had meaning beyond their own time. That belief shaped how they cut, joined, and cared for every plank. Today, when we walk into a medieval barn or stand beneath a thousand-year-old roof, we're not just seeing craftsmanship. We're seeing philosophy made physical. A worldview carved into wood. Those beams are quiet teachers. They remind us that endurance is not achieved through technology alone, but through patience, respect, and deep understanding of the materials we use. They also remind us that the wisdom of the past isn't lost, it's simply buried under convenience. Every creak of a medieval floorboard whispers the same message. If you build with nature, your work endures. If you build against it, it fails. So why did medieval wood last while ours crumbles? Because their builders didn't rush, didn't force, and didn't cheat. They listened to trees, to seasons, to experience. They used the world as it was not as they wished it to be. Their wood still stands because it was born from balance between human need and natural law. If you stand in an old timber hall or touch the beam of a thousand-year-old church, remember that wood has outlasted empires, plagues, and wars. It endures because it was made to. And that endurance is not just a lesson in construction, it's a lesson in life. History is full of forgotten genius from medieval carpenters who built eternal beams to peasants who turned mud into homes. Their knowledge still has the power to humble and inspire us. If you enjoyed uncovering the lost wisdom behind why medieval would never rotted, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Every week we explore the forgotten technologies, tools, and survival skills that built our world and how they still hold secrets we need today.